As the global population grows, are renewable energy sources the way to go? Let's take a look at the pros and cons in today's video. In a previous video, I talked about natural resources and the importance for not only making things, but also for getting energy. And we said, out of our natural resources, we have what we call non-renewable and renewable energy sources. We're looking at today renewable energy sources. These are the ones that we use the product to get energy at the same rate or slower than the earth is able to reproduce them. So it's great because the whole idea is we won't run out. They're sustainable. But are the pros greater than the cons? We'll take a look through each different source. Solar energy, what is it? Basically, it's harnessing the solar energy or the solar rays coming from the sun and using it to power devices or to charge batteries to do the same, right? Maybe you've seen the little solar panels or solar cells on a calculator. I have one back here that I could take backpacking and I could charge my cell phone or my laptop, okay? Maybe you've seen it at a local high school or a local business on the roof or basically these giant solar fields where they're capturing all that solar energy to charge or to send electricity back to that building. It sounds like an awesome idea. Let's think about some of the pros to it. One, you don't see any smoke coming off of them. I hope not, right? So they're fairly clean. That means they're not creating a lot of pollution. Okay, that's an awesome thing. Two, they're renewable. So I'm not gonna have the sun running out anytime soon, right? So that's a really good thing. Three, you can pretty much use them everywhere. So I can use them in a residential area. I can use them in a commercial area, right? They do have that nice capability of they can be out of the way. They can be on top of buildings. I don't need to build a giant tower to harness that solar energy, right? But what about some of the negatives, right? One of the things that we talk about is it has a big upfront cost. It costs lots of money to manufacture the solar panels, especially for a large building or a large city, right? They're susceptible to a lot of damage. Think about strong winds, hail, tornadoes. Okay, that would wreak havoc if our cities and our businesses depended on just solar panels. Okay, what else? We need a lot of space. Now, some residential areas, they actually put them on the roof, so we're kind of conquering that space issue. But what about in a city? Say you live on the first floor out of 30 floors. Okay, there's probably a good chance that sun isn't going to be hitting your solar panels or that entire skyscraper isn't going to be able to power every single floor. Maybe just the top floors where the solar panels are located. So there is a little bit of a logistical nightmare. Uh, what happens if the sun isn't directly on your area or the sun shifts, right? Think about the time of the year or how long the sun's out. And it's also very dependent on weather. If it's cloudy, are you getting the same amount of energy? I don't think so. So we have a lot of issues with solar panels, but there's a lot of potential there. Matter of fact, a company just came out with this idea that they're building solar cells actually in windows. So a regular typical window that you can see through, you can see back from the outside in, and it's actually created little solar cells, right? So this, make, this changes the entire ballpark of the idea of, oh, they don't look good on the roof. They're built in the window and you can't even tell. So as technology grows, this might be more of a feasible option for everybody. Wind energy is the next thing we're gonna talk about. And typically, you're gonna see what's called a wind turbine. Maybe you're driving out in the countryside and you look on the hilltops and you see this massive tower and it's got three blades that kind of expand off of it. It's a wind turbine, okay? Basically, the tower itself is about 250 feet. And again, that can range in sizes. It can go even bigger than that. So think about your favorite roller coaster ride. The blades themselves, usually three of them, extend over 120 feet, right? So think about like a third of a football field and they can go bigger. So if you're looking at the top of the spinning blade, right, we're looking close to 300, almost 400 feet for this giant wind turbine. And that's why you typically see them in the countryside. I don't think I was gonna put one in the middle of a downtown city. That'd be a little silly, not to mention, I think it'd be hitting a lot of different buildings. So wind turbines, what is it? It's basically harnessing the wind, right? We know that's a constant. We know that the earth is spinning and that's creating this Coriolis effect where basically the winds are moving and that can actually push these giant blades that generate electricity. So the pros, that's pretty clean, right? I don't see any giant smoke 
stacks coming out of it. I don't see a smog around it. Um, however, it's got a lot of cons to it. Um, like I mentioned, just like solar panels, it's a little tougher to actually build one in a city. So they're usually out in the countryside where you need a lot of space, especially right if it's going 400 feet high, you need that. Um, it becomes an aesthetic issue, right? Is it something attractive to look at? Not only do you need a lot of land, you need to make sure that the people around there actually want to see it, all right? And that becomes a problem for different areas. A lot of people actually shoot it down as far as, yeah, it's clean, but I don't want to look out that at my window, right? Or maybe the noise factor, okay? Listen to a giant fan spinning around constantly, right? That can not only scare animals, but that could just be a nuisance as far as noise pollution, okay? Um, now, this is a strange one. Um, we talk about fossil fuels having a large impact on the ecosystems and habitats, right? So you're thinking, okay, they're out of the way, they're on a giant tower. But a matter of fact, there's actually been studies to show about 500,000 birds die from wind turbines, right? Now that sounds absolutely crazy to think about, but yes, birds actually fly into them. Now this is something of kind of a hot topic as far as Hey, are they safe? Is it something that's eco-friendly? Um, that number, about 500,000 birds a year, is actually about the same as birds flying into windows and dying. So if you think about a skyscraper, um, I've even seen glass buildings such as a school where the birds are hitting the glass, right? And that's causing them to either get dazed, injured, or even cause death. It's about the same. So um, a lot of things to consider when wind turbines come into the picture. Okay, Canadian fans, here we go. Hydroelectric power. Okay, why do I say Canadian fans? Um, I'm thinking of Niagara Falls. Yes, there's the US side. The Canadian is prettier to look at. Not necessarily the town, but um, yeah, the water ripping through Niagara Falls. If you've ever watched it, there's a lot of power there. And what I mean by power is it's pushing and pushing and pushing and falling really, really fast. That can actually move fans or turbines to generate electricity. And we call that hydroelectric power. Awesome source, right? Think about it. It's not creating a lot of pollution, right? It's pretty clean. All we're doing is using water to push little fan blades or turbines. That sounds awesome. So what are some problems with hydroelectric? One, well, I can't build that where there's no water, right? So that becomes a location problem. Okay, matter of fact, about one third of the world's water sources where we can actually build something hydroelectric are already being used. So they're not viable locations. Okay, we were actually kind of running out in the US as far as where can we build a hydroelectric power plant. But the locations we do have, let's think about those. Even down on Susquehanna River near Harrisburg, right? There's one pretty far down, actually right by Three Mile Island. Okay, and it's basically just using that water flow to create energy. Now, what are some problems? Let's think about this. First off is the cost. We basically need to freeze up all that water wherever the river is location. We need to stop it or divert it. We need to build a power plant and then we need to run the water through, right? And that becomes a big engineering kind of nightmare if you think about it. One, we need to not only stop all the water, but we need to create something that causes a constant flow of water. So if you're thinking about it, Right? Think about the Hoover Dam where we actually have a reservoir of water and we can regulate how much water comes out. That means we can regulate the amount of power we're creating. So that's awesome, unless you're a fish. Okay. Now you're changing the entire ecosystem to build this and not to mention you're actually causing issues for the migration of fish, right? for those habitats. So not only we're having a problem with money, okay, that becomes an ecosystem issue. However, if you think about it, um, I think about Lake Mead out by Vegas, okay, that water reservoir is awesome for fishing now. It's awesome for boating and recreation, and so there's a lot of benefits to it. It brings in a lot of income. However, we need to think about not only the income or the expenses to build it, right, what are all the habitat losses? Um, next up, what happens when there's a drought? Okay, that actually might cause a lot more issues than you could think of. Not only does maybe the dam or the power plant not work well, it might cause a problem down the river where maybe they're not getting the same amount of water that they used to. Now, if you're depending on that for your crops, that becomes a problem. Um, and I've seen this happen countless times around the country um, where 
again, that water and recreation, where, where is that best benefiting others? Not just the power, but you know, both sides, upstream and downstream, both want that water for different reasons. And that becomes a, actually a major, major lawsuit. And they have to balance kind of people's feelings on that. On the opposite side, instead of maybe a drought, what about flooding? Okay, so maybe they're sending more water down and they're not able to handle all the water and it's spilling over the dam. So there's a lot to think about as far as controlling water. It's something awesome we can get power from, but it becomes somewhat of a problem. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, hydroelectric, great, okay, but one third of the source is already used. Well, this is kind of a catch. There's also ocean power. So basically building a power plant using the ocean's power. And where are we getting that power from? One, we could say, hey, the water in the ocean is constantly circling. There's giant, basically, channels of water moving. Okay, if you've seen Finding Nemo, you see all those little currents. However, probably the more feasible one is the tides. As water comes in or the waves come in, they also leave. And we can actually harness that to create energy. So it's connected with hydroelectric, but it's kind of its own category, um, using ocean to generate energy. Um, neat little fact, and um, I'll, I'll definitely pump in more information about this, but Scotland actually has the largest ocean, basically tidal power plant, where they're using the tides to generate a lot of electricity. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a problem with that. Not only are we adding engineering with salt water, okay, it's becoming a huge aesthetic effect. So if you're looking at it and you're gonna have beachfront property, you're probably not gonna to wanna to see, you know, all that beach go away to build a power plant. So there's been this whole kind of change in how to build this. Um, some are building it further out to sea, but that's something that is becoming a new trend or something that we're looking into as a renewable energy source. So awesome to think about. Now, as gas prices have dropped and risen and kind of going back and forth, when it's really, really high, the next power source you might hear is biofuel or biomass. Now, these are very similar, uh, but they're also very, very different. So biomass is this whole idea, bio being that life, right? And what we're doing is we're taking former life, so maybe plants, animals, right? And as they decay or as they break apart, we can use those gases right, to generate energy, just like we might use a natural gas, we could burn it. Um, or it might be something where we call it biofuel. So we're using fuel from something that's living. Um, and this is more than just like animals and plants, but it could be like vegetable oil. Um, if you guys know like a fast food restaurant, they're deep frying their fries and lots of other things, their chicken wings, okay. If you take that oil, you can actually repurpose it, recycle it, okay, it's still oil, for a fuel source. So that's a pretty neat thing that's coming out. Um, a lot of people are starting to kind of do it in their cars, if you, especially if you have a diesel vehicle. It's really easy to change kind of that veggie oil towards that diesel, so biodiesel, um, pretty neat. Um, it might be from grains. Um, I think about kind of corn. Corn has become this huge industry towards what we call biofuel. And the reason for it is we can make something called ethanol, um, which is kind of like an alcohol. But what we're doing is we're actually pulling, right, that corn, we're actually creating an oil from that and we can burn that. Um, ethanol is actually in almost all gases. So if I go to the gas station, fill my car, right, if you ever look, it says like 10% ethanol. And that number changes based on whether it's summer or winter, but it's a biofuel. And there's a lot of different sources out there. Uh, but again, the whole idea is we're using plant life, old, you know, animals and all sorts of other things to generate fuel. Um, a simple one that maybe you're like still trying to struggle connecting what biomass and biofuel is, is wood. All right, trees were once living, we chopped them down and we burn that wood, whether it's wood pellets or just, you know, wood logs for fuel. So we're generating heat and that maybe heat spins a steam turbine. So anything that was living, that we are using for a fuel source or energy source is biomass or maybe biofuel. On the negatives of biomass and biofuel, um, so as much as we could be recycling products, um, there's usually a problem with when we come to burning it or we're waiting for it to decay or using those gases, um, it's very costly. So to build something that's very efficient and not pollutant, right, there's a big cost involved. When I say non-pollutant, right, if we're all burning trees, 
okay, that's going to cause a lot of smoke, it's going to cause a lot of carbon dioxide, um, and that becomes a problem of its own. So biomass, biofuel, there is somewhat of a carbon dioxide release there um, that we need to worry about, um, and also the cost efficiency. If we're all starting burning trees as well, it might stop being renewable because we're burning more trees that we can consume. So something to look into um, as far as biomass, but it's definitely an alternative to fossil fuels where we're using coals and natural gas. Okay, next up we have geothermal power, right? So what is geothermal? All right, first off, so geo basically means like the earth. So we're talking about the layers of the earth. And it has to do with basically sending a piping system deeper into the Earth's surface to usually harness the heat to create energy. Um, now we can use this on a residential system if we want to. So think about your house. Um, you might set up a pipe system in the backyard or basically in a large area. And they're typically about six feet deep, if not a little bit deeper. And what they do is there's a fluid that runs back and forth from your house through all the wet pipes in the ground. And if it's cold outside, it's winter, usually we can pull some warmth out of there. Or if it's summer, right, we can pull cooler fluid through there. So there's kind of this nice heating and cooling system. Okay, if we're talking about commercially, okay, those pipes go a lot deeper than six feet. Okay, they go thousands and thousands of feet deep. And usually if you're going deeper, right, you're going closer towards the mantle if you think about it that way, or towards vents for volcanoes and stuff like that, hot springs or geysers. Um, I'll bring up why in a second. But you're pulling the heat and that heat is causing turbines to spin and we're creating energy. So a little different from a residential house to a commercial area, um, but a pretty neat system of using fluids and pipes to gather the energy from deep down below. Um, the largest geothermal power plant is the Geysers Geothermal Complex, and it's actually located right by San Francisco. It's actually using a bunch of different power plants um, it's a whole network of systems, but think about it, they're using geysers or pipes that go really far in the ground to kind of catch that geothermal heat, that venting from what would be volcanoes or from hot springs, and they're using it to generate power. So a neat thing to kind of check out if you have time, um, but what are we talking about as far as negatives? This sounds great, all right, pipes going underneath the ground. That takes a lot of work, so it takes a lot of money. Um, you need to be in the right location, okay, there are, isn't, you know, massive vents everywhere around the world, um, especially in different states, okay? San Francisco is a little different because they're pretty close to different fault lines that they can actually do this a lot easier. So we need to be in the right location. We need to have the money to do it. We need to make sure we do it up front, right? If I'm starting to build a city, okay, I can put it in, right? If I've already built the city, it would take too much to get underneath all those buildings. So that's why it turns typically to a residential area where I can put in my backyard. So I need a lot of land, uh, but as far as the surface, okay, it goes untouched, right? So all those habitats, all those animals are running through my backyard, okay, they are rather untouched. They don't even know there's a system underneath. So there's that benefit, um, but really a big, big cost, um, but the effects of it, right, very small in pollution, right? We don't have a lot of pollution or carbon dioxide going up from it. Um, so pretty neat as a renewable energy source. The last renewable energy source we're going to talk about is hydrogen gas. And I'm using it as just the element because there's a couple branches to how do we get hydrogen gas. For one, okay, if you watched one of my previous videos in chemistry, we took H2O, water, and we split it using electrolysis into hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen, if you know the elements, it is a gas and it's a flammable gas. So we could actually go through the process of splitting water and getting hydrogen. Right? And we would use that as a gas, just like we would use natural gas. We could use it in tanks and we could use it for a lot of different things. Um, that's one possibility for hydrogen gas, right? It would be pretty clean. However, the cost is really, really kind of high in getting that hydrogen gas. All right, but next up, hydrogen gas as far as nuclear reactors. Okay, so we talked about nuclear reactors or kind of the nuclear energy being Fission. So that basically means we're using uranium and it breaks apart, right? And that's causing the energy. What if we had atoms smashing together, right? Fusion, right? So the fusion happening and we're using hydrogen to do that. What would happen? We'd be creating a fusion power plant. This is extremely clean, um, but it's extremely, extremely hard to do. 
Um, there's actually one being built in kind of like France, I, I'm pretty sure it's France, where they're building a power plant using hydrogen gas. So that's pretty neat. We'll watch as that develops to see if it's something feasible, if it's something that's safer than when we're using fission. But we would have an unlimited resource in a sense for energy source. And once it's there, it is huge. So this is something that could actually lead to all cities being powered by fusion because of hydrogen gas. So something neat to kind of look forward to. Um, but again, the cost for that, super expensive. Okay, the dangers involved, they're there. Is the technology up to par? We're gonna have to wait and find out because there's a lot of countries that have come together to build that first one. So we'll see. This is super exciting as far as renewable energy sources. Um, as I mentioned with non-renewable energy sources, that makes up for a majority of how countries and consumers get their energy. But there is a growing number of countries that are increasing their use, their reliance on renewable energy sources. And the U.S. is one of those, okay? There might be certain individuals living off the grid using, again, maybe a small wind turbine. Um, I know a guy on a sailboat, he had a small wind turbine and that powered everything on a sailboat and that's actually where he lived. So a neat idea, but I'm not sure if all of us want to do that. So hopefully you enjoyed today's video. Hopefully you grew in your knowledge of renewable energy sources. Thanks for watching.